The festive season has begun with gusto. Despite money worries, for most people, the mood is upbeat. In the first full-fledged post-pandemic celebration of festivals across India, people are out and about and willing to travel and visit each other. Claiming to be back at pre-COVID levels, India's leading ride-hailing app, Uber, says it's time to stop talking of recovery and talk of growth instead. To offer us the big-picture view on growth prospects, customer expectations in a changed world, brand identity, new initiatives and the competitive landscape. I'm joined by Prabjeet Singh. He's the president of Uber India, also responsible for the mobility business in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Prabjeet, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me on the show, Anuradha. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, let's start by talking about growth. I have some numbers that I have seen and where it comes to auto, and uh, Moto, which is, I guess, bikes. That's right. Uh, you've got some 220% increase over January 2020 and 120% increase again over January 2020 for Moto. So this is low-cost mobility. Give me up the picture here for growth. Explain this and then let's move to cars. So, Nurada, Uber's in the business of moving people from yeah. point A to point B. Yeah. And when the cities shut down, Uber also came to a halt. Mm. But as cities have opened up and yeah. people have started moving out, we have also been on standby mm. and are now seeing resurgent rebound mm. in the business. Uh, we are seeing not just growth across the platform, but particularly certain categories. Mm. So for example, as you mentioned, low cost solutions yeah. have absolutely taken off, particularly post the mm. pandemic, uh, three wheelers and two wheelers. Mm. This is how, by the way, majority of the country actually travels. Yes. They don't travel by air conditioned cars, which was yeah. originally how Uber entered the market mm. and how most of our early consumers know us mm. as. So we are seeing uh, multiple folds of growth on three wheelers mm. and two wheelers. Uh, large part of that is driven by, these are affordable solutions. Uh, they're also solving a core consumer need mm. of being able to get a uh, three-wheeler, two-wheeler at a doorstep, which otherwise you would not be able mm. to do. Mm. We are also seeing, by the way, similar strong growth on other segments, for mm. example, intercity. What is growth looking like in your core business or the first offering, which I would guess is still the lion's share of your revenues, isn't it? And that is the, the taxis, the cars. So the way we look at the business, Anuradha, is cars, auto and moto. Yeah. Uh, and then there are new mm. initiatives which I'm happy to talk about, mm. uh, which you have recently piloted. Now in the core cars business, the bulk of the mm. business is in moving people within a city from point A to point B. Mm. Could be for commute use cases, could be for recreation use cases, So what's et the growth you're seeing there? So we are seeing that uh, that segment is now uh, just shy of full recovery mm. uh, pre-pandemic. It is very much correlated to whether offices have opened up and whether mm. commuters are back to using the service for the same frequency and going to office that often. So we are seeing now that just shy of full recovery, while other categories have actually uh, are all in the growth phase now. Uh, right. So, and if you were to give me a sense of which category contributes what to your revenues, that would help, even if you're not going to give me any direct numbers. I'll give you a fun fact, Anuradha, which mm. I, I would imagine many of your viewers may not mm. know. Today, Uber in India does more trips mm. in terms of volume on three wheelers and two wheelers mm. than on four wheelers. Mm. So that gives you a rough sense of where the volume split is. And when it comes to value, obviously mm. uh, the trips on a car based service mm. tend to be more uh, expensive just given the cost of operations is higher. Mm. Uh, but we there might still see about three fourths of our revenue coming from the cars business mm. uh, and about a fourth of the revenue coming from our three wheelers and two wheelers. Mm. But that is changing rapidly. Yeah, because I was just it, it's interesting because you're saying that cars are giving you three fourths of your revenues roughly and still not yet fully recovered. Uh, and there are changes in the way people are behaving, especially in terms of office commutes. And you have low cost mobility growing so f fabulously. So does that mean that strategically you're going to reallocate the resources behind these two categories? I mean, low cost and cars? Look, we need to step back, Anuradha. What are we trying to build? We are trying to build a mobility solution hmm for the next hundreds and millions of users in India. Mm. So all our resource allocation is actually talking to that. And the future growth will come from the length and breadth of the country, mm. from segments we have actually not catered to in the past. Mm. So that's why we see three wheelers and two wheelers actually continuing to get a significant share of the investments mm. we make, mm. because these are categories which are still very nascent. Mm. We are in the process of getting more drivers and riders to the platform. Mm. Uh, we'll continue to invest behind new experiences on the core cars business. So mm. for example, 
as we speak, uh, we have scaled up our hmm. rentals and intercity service within the cars portfolio. Hmm. So we are beginning to see further differentiation within the traditional categories also. Mm. So our investments are very much on tech uh, resourcing mm. on all the products, mm. but I do anticipate the future will involve Uber looking far more different from then what you have known it in the past. We'll have three wheelers, two wheelers, we'll have buses. Yeah. We have recently actually launched a pilot for mm. buses in one of the cities and we hope to scale that up. Yeah, I, I t tell us a little bit more about that because the way things are going, uh, I think our cities will require more public transport and will require a lot of car users to start taking public transport, right? So talk to us a little bit about that pilot. Another, we at Uber mm. fundamentally have three core theses. Mm. We believe that shared mobility is the path forward mm. for India, mm. where we need to challenge fundamentally private ownership of vehicles. Uh, to encourage shared mobility, we also need to thereby make services mm. available at price points which are affordable yeah. and in a way which consumers are used to using services. Mm. That's why we are taking the same technology and now deploying it in high capacity vehicles yeah. or buses. So what we have done now is uh, in select cities, more mm. recently in Gurgaon, we are mm. running a couple of pilots. One of them is with the Gurgaon Municipal Development mm. Authority, where we are taking uh, the buses which are owned by the local authorities mm and making them available on the Uber app. Mm. So these are air conditioned buses. Mm. You get to pre-select the seat, you have a pre-booked seat. You can see the ETA is the same way mm. as you can mm. see for other services on the Uber app. And we do believe this will fundamentally encourage some consumers to mm. go back to using public transport in a big way. We're also running other combinations of these pilots, for example, mm. for corporates, mm. where certain corporates post pandemic uh, told us that they would like to have the flexibility, the mm. safety and the affordability of an Uber service, but they would like to make sure that they move consumers, their employees yeah. from yeah. home and workplace yeah. uh, in bigger vehicles. So we are actually running a bunch of pilots around that. I would imagine that for if we kind of fast forward five years from mm. now, the way I'm speaking about three wheelers and mm. two wheelers becoming a very large part of the portfolio, I do anticipate we will see that happen in other parts of the portfolio, including buses. This continues to be mm. a market which pushes us to innovate mm. and some of these innovations are now being taken global and that's mm. why India is such a special part of the mm. Uber ecosystem. Yeah. Not just as an incredibly powerful market but for what we are doing and building here. Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, cash payments was an India innovation. You had to do it, right, uh, for India. Uh, so India makes you and Indian consumers and customers make people have to rethink and customize the solutions that are being offered in this market. Surge pricing is something that has constantly been debated and talked about. We know the CCI, the Competition Commission of India, earlier this month has asked you guys, all you guys, to be more transparent and self-regulate. We know that the Consumer Affairs Ministry is also, you know, weighed in on this. What is the transparency that you can offer customers when it comes to surge pricing? Because that seems to be something, uh, no matter what the convenience that you'll offer, surge pricing seems to be a trade-off that they're not that we are not willing to come to terms with. Uh, Anuradha, I do think we are in a ninth year of our operation yeah. uh, now. I do think across the ecosystem from riders, drivers, regulators, and the wider influencers mm. in the ecosystem, there's a very deep appreciation and understanding of what dynamic pricing does. Mm. At the end of the day, what we are trying to do is match pools of demand, which is deeply demand variable, and, supply, and, yeah. pool, and pools yeah. of supply, which also tends yeah. to be deeply variable, which has multiple other choices. And thereby the pricing is a balancing factor which mm. plays out. Uh, the two core theses we have already deployed. Mm. One is we are actually already providing one of the most transparent pricing mm. mechanism. For example, today, versus say 10 years back when ride hailing apps didn't exist. When you open the app, you actually get a estimation of the fare from point A to point B to the second decimal on the app. Mm. Uh, second, uh, for some reason, if because the route was different or there was a, a mm. change in the pricing through the trip, you have avenues which are where within a 24 hour window, somebody will be available through an in-app request to mm. respond to any queries you may have. Third, there is a very clear transparency mm. in terms of uh, in all the cities we operate in, we make sure that we are compliant with the local regulations. Yeah. So each city t tends to have specific pricing criteria which we mm. adhere to across the board. Mm. So I do think this is now a core part and a core acceptance of the ride hailing category. I think the feedback when it comes from multiple other authorities, we continue to engage and work mm. on that. Uh, I do believe that 
now we have reached a stage where even other industries, for example, Indian railways, mm. uh, uh, are using dynamic are using pricing. Dynamic pricing. Mm. It has been a, a part of the hospitality industry, mm. airlines industry for mm. time immemorial. Mm. So when the Competition Commission of India says we would like self-regulation in surge pricing and transparency on this front, what could it be? What could you offer as a, you know, as a premier ride-hailing service in this country? What could you offer? Uh, it is too early to comment on mm. the specifics of mm. what the Competition Commission has recommended. Mm. Uh, we are actually engaged in the process, so yeah, it's not sure, been a... Course. A unilateral recommendation. Yeah. We are evaluating yeah, the recommendations sure and we'll work on that into on and we'll board. continue to iterate. Yeah. Look, what we do today, how mm. the Uber app looks and feels today, yeah. as we spoke about, is so different from what it was a few years back. Mm. And we'll continue to iterate and improve. Mm. And we're pretty confident that all these inputs will help us become mm. a far better and far more efficient and loved service. And as we get to serve the next 100 million consumers, the only way we, they mm. will embrace us is if there is transparency, yeah. if we walk through on our promise of reliability and safety. What will take you on the path to 100 million? How far are you from 100 million? And how many years? And who's going to get you to 100 million? <laughs> it is an ongoing journey. <laughs> for, those, <laughs> for those of who know me, they know that I avoid crystal ball gazing. Mm. But we are on an accelerated path to having mm. 100 million active consumers mm. on the platform. Mm. These will come from length and breadth of the country, not just from the top seven to eight cities. Mm. Uh, we are already in 120 plus cities yeah. in the country. And we are expanding that network. In fact, we're launching cities mm where the first product might be a three-wheeler or a two-wheeler based service. Right. Because that is what is a better product market fit for, for that, those geographies. Yeah. What we're also doing is focusing on two or three core investments. Mm -hmm. For example, we are finding ways to partner with other players mm -hmm. in the ecosystem. Uh, so for example, uh, we recently done a partnership with Amazon uh, and mm -hmm. with WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. With yeah. Amazon Prime, it's about being able to tap into the high paying e-commerce mm. user mm. Uh, and uh, encourage them to actually upgrade to better experiences mm. uh, because they have the privilege of being part of the, the prime membership. Mm. At the same time, we're partnering with WhatsApp to yeah. do, again, a very India first innovation. So you innovation. don't download the app. Don't download the Uber yeah. app, right? Because some of our consumers yeah. said that I'm actually comfortable using yeah. WhatsApp. Yeah. Uh, my parents I don't yeah. want to download another yeah. app. How do you, but I still want to give them the option of yeah. uh, booking an Uber themselves. So we're actually running uh, after a successful pilot in Lucknow, we now launched the service in Delhi, where through the WhatsApp uh, mm -hmm. interface, you can request for an Uber and the same experience will flow through. All of this is being built in India, for India, by India-based engineering and teams. You, and you do a revenue share with WhatsApp and, uh, yeah, combination and Amazon of, Prime, uh, is that how it works? So it's a combination of commercial constructs, mm. uh, because this is win-win for multiple mm. platforms. And it's not just, these partnerships are not just limited to what we're doing on the mm. demand side. Mm. We're also on the supply side. At the end of the day, for us to provide the service, yeah. we need to have yeah. more yeah. vehicles and drivers on yeah. the platform. So for example, recently, uh, we brought to India our, one of our largest mobility fleet play mm. partner from Middle East and Africa mm. uh, to India, a player called Move, which is committing to putting thousands of new vehicles of different form factors, mm. uh, which will then allow us to provide mm. uh, different experiences to consumers. Uh, we are also partnering uh, in the sustainability ecosystem, yeah, recognizing so that it is on. shifting yeah. very quickly. Yeah. How do we innovate in bringing uh, the mm. right quantum of electric and hybrid vehicles on the platform? Mm so that we can see how the economics of those works mm -hmm. on ride hailing so that eventual adoption by drivers can be accelerated. You're one of two large players in this country between Uber India and Ola. I'm guessing you'll have the market to yourselves largely, even though there are other players. The question is, what is the brand distinction today? Because let me speak to you now as a customer. Uh, I use um, Uber Go and Ola Mini very, very frequently for my office commutes, okay? And I find that the drivers invariably offer both the services, right? So they have both the apps. So it doesn't matter to me at the end of the day that driver exchange doesn't really give me a brand experience because it could be Ola or Uber. So how does the brand stand out? What, how, why is the brand distinct? What are you relying on to create a brand experience? When it comes to brand, uh, we believe that the brand promise will follow the service promise. Hmm. The service promise has three pillars, affordability, safety, and reliability. Mm. We need to make sure that we are providing and meeting the consumer expectations mm. on all three. And that is what will make the difference in when you open and you have a choice and you will have choice mm. of not just one app, but you will have choice of multiple apps. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a very competitive market. 
uh, why you should choose Uber will be if you know that each time mm. when you request the vehicle, the vehicle comes on time. Uh, if there's an issue, you are able to resolve it through support. Mm. And it is a price which you are comfortable mm. with and which is predictable. Now, we are very much obsessed with getting the core service quality right. The brand promise further amplifies the core service promise. And for us, our brand promise gives us the real edge when we combine the global brand which Uber stands for, mm. which is uh, stands for an inclusive, uh, enabling brand, which really ignites opportunities for mm. millions of drivers and earners mm. and millions of consumers, and combine that with the core ethics and the core ethos of India. So, for example, recently uh, we did a pretty big campaign uh, to mm. uh, promote our three-wheeler and two-wheeler yeah. service. Uh, it was a campaign which was inspired by real-life mm. stories of consumers. Mm. Not consumers necessarily like you and I, mm. but consumers who use this service. They are inspired by stories of, uh, uh, for example, mm. a bride who wanted to find a way to obviously meet, uh, fulfill her mm. uh, professional commitments yeah. combined with her yeah. personal commitments. So, no, Prabhjit, so I, I think that yeah. brand comes together in a very, very unique and So that's the communication of the brand. But this, the experience of the brand, if the cars at the end of the day are shared between you know, different apps, and if the apps have more or less similar interfaces and technologies, how, do, how does it really matter to me whether I'm driving Uber or an Ola and do, should that not matter to you? At the end of the day, the drivers and the service they are mm. providing is face of Uber. Mm. We are the technology which is only empowering them. Yeah. So there are two ways we are looking to address mm. that. Uh, no, rather, the first thing is we consistently believe that choice which the drivers have is something we absolutely embrace and celebrate. Mm. We uh, don't put any constraint that the driver has to drive only on mm. Uber, etc., etc. Uh, I think that uh, is yeah. what the core proposition of a gig work yes. and independent work is. Yes. But what we are beginning to see, and mm. this is where uh, I would urge you to each time ask that question to the driver, mm. the same driver, because of the standards which the Uber platform is setting, mm. because it's a community of drivers and riders, we set very explicit standards mm. and expect certain service quality. Mm. Often, this, we expect the same driver to behave differently. Uh, make sure that they are following those standards mm. and guidelines. I don't want to comment on other competitors sure. in the market. And that is what plays out in a combination of technology solutions mm. and operation solutions, mm. which we are rolling out. I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example. We are running a pilot uh, on in some of the cities on how do we make sure that the driver has full visibility mm. on where the trip is, uh, where the destination for the consumer is. Uh, we are also mm. working on multiple ways to make mm. sure that the driver gets compensated for long pickups. Sure. If our technology is able to mm. make the estimate more accurately, mm -hmm. the driver consistently will want yeah. to then drive with us. He or she will then want to make mm. sure that when a consumer from Uber comes, the experience is actually mm. far better than on any other platform. Mm. Uh, the, the driver also knows that we have his or her back. So the driver knows that if there is a conflict mm. for uh, whatever reason, there is a uh, argument, sure. there will be support channels available to mm. them. So I think combination of these factors, the, the other thing which you also do with drivers is, for example, invest in their well-being, which, yeah. for example... I know you've done gender sensitization and, you know, eye testing and vision, uh, yeah. you know, support for drivers. You know, so the, are you saying, Prabhjit, that if I book the same car and driver via o uh, Uber versus another app, I will get a different experience? We aspire for that. Uh, Anuradha, this does not happen all the time, mm. but uh, through the processes of the way we engage with the drivers, mm. we actually spend crazy amount of time mm. uh, listening to drivers. So, mm. for example, we have a driver advisory council. Mm. These are 40 uh, drivers mm. across six cities who meet us periodically. They look at what is being developed as product mm. solutions, give us feedback, we incorporate. Mm. Uh, we hold listening sessions. Mm. Uh, we often drive ourselves. I, for example, every six months mm. take the, mm. the wheels uh, right. myself and drive to get feedback. Yeah. And then we work to make the driver experience better. Mm. And these small iterations which we keep doing you make an incredible difference eventually. And create the Uber brand as distinct yes. from uh, the other. And that's why you can see that that shows up in terms of 
why we have been able to kind of scale mm. our business, why mm. we've been able to today attract mm. a much larger proportion of mm. drivers and riders mm. than any other platform yeah, in the, the market. The, you know, the, the amount that you take from the drivers is the pretty much uniform between both the, uh, you know, both the market leaders. And uh, even the transactions are, the, the time duration you take to settle transactions is the same. So for them, I'm curious about what the incentive will and, be. And, and I think exactly to, to a consumer, what you see is only 1% of what happens, which is what happens yeah. in the physical world. Sure. Behind the scenes, yeah. the, remember Uber is operating in mm. more than 60 countries. Mm. We have upwards of 3 million drivers globally, right. which means we are constantly iterating our products and mm. services. There's an innovation in Latin America, mm. which we have found working great. We mm. quickly bring it to India. Mm. The same way we take innovation from India to global markets. Mm. And that makes our scale a real strength. Mm. We are able to then create different experiences on yeah. all these factors across the board. And that's why you can see that also in the pace at which yeah. we are growing in the market. The drivers in India are very different from what it is in other parts of the country, especially in the US where Uber started. And here you have professional drivers. You have somebody who owns the car mm. and somebody else who drives it professionally, right? Um, tell me how the drivers have been, uh, you know, how they dealt with the last two years of a complete shutdown or partial shutdowns over two years because the cars that most of them are offering us these days are really not up to the mark and i'm putting it down as a you know user as a um, you know as a rider to uh, to the pandemic impact is it or is there just a general drop in services in terms of basic car quality so another the two years of the pandemic were hard were mm -hmm. hard not just for humanity but particularly for f people whose livelihood mm. de depended yeah. on categories like mobility which got impacted yeah. uh, and ride hailing drivers were definitely mm. uh, impacted as platforms we tried our best mm. to support them uh, but the best way we could support them was to get them more business mm. which is as and when cities have opened up their earnings have continued to increase during that period two things happen one is Drivers who would normally go through a buying cycle hmm. where they would, once a vehicle le reaches yeah. near end of life, yeah. they would upgrade back to a new vehicle yeah. or somebody would buy a second vehicle, which is a pattern we're hmm. seeing, came to a grinding halt. That hmm. was also obvious hmm. in the sales of commercial vehicles, yeah. which crashed year on year, both yeah. through 20, uh, 2020 and 21. Uh, the second thing it also shows up hmm. is uh, the drivers would naturally tend to hmm. extend the life of the vehicle. Now, we heard drivers, we took that feedback, we recognized that was a reality. Mm. So we have actually now made some pretty material shifts which will begin to show impact mm. on ground. One is we are partnering with large fleets mm. and OEMs and financiers to reignite the, mm. uh, the creation of new vehicles being purchased. And you can mm. see that mm. the number of commercial cars being sold mm. uh, is again spiking up. Yeah. Uh, majority of them are actually coming mm. to ride hailing categories. Uh, so that will begin to show over a period of time. Uh, the second thing is we're finding ways to work with the drivers and provide them additional support. Mm. So for example, uh, if they're vehicles which are getting older and they need support in figuring out uh, uh, how to get them repaired, et cetera. So we kind of work with them, mm. advise them whether they should be putting those vehicles. We also advise mm. them to certain vehicles should not be used for intercity routes, et cetera. Yeah. So again, we are working very closely so with the driver community. there is a lot of effort going into improving the quality of the cars Absolutely. that are on the road that we can access uh, via the app. And you can see that. You can see that happening. Mm. For That's why when you say we're bringing in new fleet partners, mm. including international ones to India, and they've all made commitments for mm. putting in thousands of new vehicles over the next three years, you'll begin to see that play out across mm. the board. We know that uh, in India, you have uh, uh, large teams working that are supporting the tech operations for Uber in many parts of the world, so Uber globally. Give me a sense of what that, you know, how that works. So another, India is not just an incredibly exciting long-term market mm. for us. It's also a source for innovation mm. where things being piloted in India are being taken globally mm. and in a very large talent hub. We have more than 2,200 employees in India. Mm. Majority of them are actually engineers who are building end-to-end -end tech solutions mm. for the world. Mm. There are 13 different programs uh, which are being supported from our Bangalore and Hyderabad tech centers. Mm. We are uh, accelerating our hiring in the country for engineers mm. and they are not just working mm. on micro solutions which are not visible they mm. actually got full end-to-end -end responsibility so for example high capacity vehicles yeah we spoke about and the entire tech stack yeah. is being built in India uh, we spoke about uh, whatsapp to ride which is again a global mm. first innovation the entire solution the user experience the data science work uh, the core product design is happening 
by our uh, mm. tech leadership uh, and tech teams in Bangalore and Hyderabad. So you will expect that this will lead to uh, a benefit for the India market, mm. of course, mm. but also the power of Indian tech talent, which is just incredible, uh, will become a real source of competitive advantage for us globally. Right. Uh, Prabhjit, I'm going to have to let you go, close this here. I know, I mean, there's so much to talk about, you know, gig workers, ride drivers, employees. I know deep, globally that debate is on, um, but we'll park that for another time, I think. Thank you very much for coming into our studio here in Mumbai, and I wish you and the entire team at Uber a lot of good luck. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Look out for another conversation that looks at business through the top line lens on Media Dialogues here on CNBC TV 18.